Uh, sorry to begin the service today with a joke that I've told many times. It's a Minnie Pearl joke. For those of you who remember Minnie Pearl, you know, she said that brother was not all that swift. He wasn't. Brother back in Grinder's Switch. He went into the blacksmith shop one day, and the blacksmith said, Now, brother, don't, uh, don't you touch that horseshoe. It's hot. And brother commenced to pick the thing up, and he threw it down real quick. And the blacksmith said, I told you it was hot, wasn't it? He said, Nope. Just doesn't take me long to look at a horseshoe. Well, to see, I'll tell it as long as you're laughing, so you <laughs> never get rid of that joke. Minnie Pearl did a better job telling it, but she's not here today. So um, I have to tell it in her stead. It's a reminder that there is nothing that teaches us quite like experience. What's the old line? Experience is the best teacher. And... Um, Albert Einstein, I don't think I quote him very often, I couldn't quote most of what he talked about, but he did say that all that we know, we know through experience. And um, God knows that. God teaches us through experience. And what I'm going to tell you in the sermon today is that not that everybody has to have a profound, overwhelming, <laughs> Pentecostal experience. Uh, if that were to break out among us today, uh, we might not know what to do. Uh, but it, it was an extraordinary event, and we don't, are not likely to see that happen in most churches maybe any of, well, none of them, I think, today. It was a, it was a kind of a one-off. But it was also necessary. But I'm going to tell you that we don't have to have that kind of experience, but it does need to rise to the level where we feel something, where the gospel touches us somewhere around the heart, where we don't just say we're grateful, but we are indeed grateful. But that kind of experience was needed by the, early, by the early church because they, they, they were experiencing the absence of the Lord. Uh, Luke uh, tells us that these appearances from Jesus covered a period of 40 days. And... Uh, that period had ended with the ascension of our Lord, and they were feeling alone and lonely. Luke does something brilliantly. He tells us something that they did right before Pentecost. Now, there was only a short time before that ascension uh, time and uh, 10 days or something like that, and Pentecost Sunday. But during that period, uh, they, did, they were a typical church, and they realized that their committee of 12, and you know, sometimes people begin to think that churches are about committees, okay? Their committee of 12 was missing one person. And they had no idea in the world how to replace Judas Iscariot on their committee of 12, the first 12 disciples, because Jesus was not there. And what they had done all through his ministry was he had called the shots. What he wanted is what they did. He chose the disciples. How in the world could they make a decision now about who would be the next disciple filling the vacant spot? <laughs> well, they decided on a plan. I don't know whether they used a hat or what it was, but they decided to put names in a hat or in a pot, and they, <laughs> and they would draw a name to see who was going to be the 12th disciple. So they did that. I guess it worked. They chose Matthias. We never heard of Matthias again, but most of the disciples we didn't hear much about after that time. And the committee was complete again, but now what are they going to do? He, he has told them this ragtag bunch of uh, uh, fishermen and uh, Ex, uh, ex-publicans, ex-tax uh, collectors, uh, 
mostly uneducated. Matthew may have been pretty well educated. He had had money while he was a tax collector, had nothing now. This, this poor bunch of people who were basically not continually employed now that in following Jesus, that had been mostly their job, although the fishermen had continued fishing, he, he had told them, it must have sounded ridiculous to them, to take, take the gospel, his word, his teaching about God's love for humanity to the, to the whole world, to the ends of the earth. How in the world were they going to do that? I would have felt a bit discouraged, and I think they did. What we need to remember, though, and we, I want us to apply this to our lives, anytime we feel discouraged, there is a power available to us. And it is, and I'm not exaggerating, the very power that drives the universe. It is the power of heaven. It is the power of the, of the resurrection. And this power is available to us. When our Lord told us where two or more gather in my name, I'm going to be there amongst you. He was quite serious about that. His spirit is with us now. It is he who is with us now. He is present here with us now. I can address us. I can address him. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. And he hears me and he hears you. So what do you do with this discouraged and puzzled bunch of people who have this word from the Lord placed upon them which seems beyond their possibilities? Well, you have Pentecost. God is an opportunist. There was an opportunity for Pentecost because Pentecost was actually an ancient Jewish holiday. I know when um, uh, Mr. Mr. Myerson, for whom the Symphony Center in Dallas was named, uh, wanted to meet with me a couple of years ago, and he came by the church, and we had a great time together. And Mr. Myerson is Jewish, and he brought me uh, a loaf of bread because it was around Pentecost and it is also a Jewish holiday called Sabbat or Pentecost and, and it was a thanksgiving for the harvest originally then it was a thanksgiving for the law and he brought me, uh, he brought me a loaf of bread which by the way was very good bread uh, and uh, it was a reminder that we share this holiday with the Jewish people, but for a very different meaning. And now there weren't just 12 of those disciples gathered in that upper room. There were 120 of them, uh, Luke tells us, give or take one or two, may not have had an exact count on worship attendance that day. And, and there were people from all over the known world, really, who were in town in Jerusalem at that moment, because that's where the temple was, and they were gathered there for the celebration of Pentecost. And this was the opportunity that God chose. These people who were already gathered quite early in the morning, it was before nine o'clock when, when it started, so they had early worship. They had gathered, I can see them singing hymns and remembering the Lord, and then this event happened. Well, I realize to you that I haven't read the scripture yet, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together, and suddenly the sound like the blowing of a wind, a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the room where they were sitting, and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and resting on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now... They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together to, in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? That means the, the disciples themselves, and they were, 
that how is that each of one of us hears them in our native tongue. And then it goes on to name uh, the different folks who were there, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappia, Cappadocia and Pontius and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya and Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism and Cretans and Arabs and we hear each one speaking in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, the individual elements of this seem so strange. But you know, there's one thing that, that I do know something about and maybe a little bit more about it than a lot of other people. It's something that is almost not discussed at all with ministers in seminary. It's something most people have no training in whatsoever. Uh, when I was in Perkins, and I think this is true to this day, uh, students do not even read the seminal work on religious experience. That's what I'm talking about, religious experience, which is William James, Varieties of William Religious Experience from around 1907. It's a masterpiece. He was, he was brilliant beyond words. And there's little talk of it when in fact what the church rests on is the experience of God. And what drives the church today is that same spirit which those disciples experienced. And this seems like a, a strange and one-off thing. But I want to show you that, that it's not. And I want to show you then what is really different about it. First of all, there was that wind blowing. And uh, I want to read you the conversion experience of Bill Wilson. How many of you know who Bill Wilson is? He was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, this was many, many years ago, of course. He got desperate and called on God, which he had never done before, and suddenly the room lit up with a bright white light. I was caught up in an ecstasy. There must have been a great ecstasy, a great joy in that upper room that day, which there was no words to describe. It seemed to me in my mind that I was on a mountain and a wind, not of air, but a spirit was blowing. And then it burst in upon me that I was in another world of consciousness. All about me and through me was this wonderful presence. And I thought to myself, so this is the God the preachers talk about. So there was that wind from heaven. And then there was that fire, tongues of fire. This really was that light, which is a part of so many experiences, because not only is God love, God is light. God is the light from which that light came when he said in the, be in the beginning, let there be light. This is another experience from the 19th century from uh, R.M. Buck. I spent the evening in a quiet city with two friends reading and discussing poetry and philosophy. I had a long drive home in a handsome cab my mind deeply under the influence of the ideas and the emotions. And all at once, without warning of any kind, I found myself wrapped in a flame-colored cloud. For an instant, I thought the city was on fire. But then I realized this fire was within myself. That same fire which rested on those at Pentecost. And the third thing, and this is the thing that gets the most intention, was those tongues. And a lot of people think this was glossolalia. Glossolalia means speaking in tongues. If you want to hear somebody speak in tongues, just turn on your TV set to one of those TV preachers, and it can happen pretty often with some of them. Paul didn't care much about it. Paul said he could do it, but, but he didn't find it very edifying. Paul said, if somebody does speak in tongues, you better have an interpreter there because nobody's going to get the gospel from somebody who's speaking 
in something that sounds kind of like gibberish. I think it's a genuine religious experience. I don't think anybody can actually interpret that experience uh, if someone is speaking in glossolalia. It is where people have uh, reached beyond words, and I think, yes, that a lot of people, TV preachers, uh, are just playing with it. All right. I don't think they're having the experience when we see them there on the tree. Okay. They generally go from, from that experience to uh, asking you to send them some money. All right. So, no, I, do, I, do, I don't believe that. But I do believe that for a lot of people it can be a genuine. But I don't believe that's what happened at Pentecost. I believe what happened at Pentecost is exactly what it says. Everybody heard everybody else in their own language as if they were all of one language. They didn't need language to communicate. And if you read enough of these near-death experiences, you're going to find that that's the way communication happens in heaven. Let me read you a little bit about uh, from, from uh, Reverend Lewis Tucker, who was an Episcopal priest. And he was met in heaven by his father, whom he said looked exactly the way his father had looked in life. And he asked his father if he always, he asked his father if he had any work to do. And his father said, yes, he did work in heaven. There was work for him. He said, do you always look like this? And his father said, no, I do not. Soon I discovered that we were not talking, but we were merely thinking. He thought a question, and I thought an answer without actually speaking. The process was practically instantaneous. Now, you probably don't speak French, but if you were in heaven, you would be able to talk to anybody who did speak French but didn't speak English because the communication is instantaneous. We, in this world, call it telepathy. But in heaven, it's just talking. And anybody in heaven can talk to anybody else at any time. And I think that's what happened at Pentecost. God actually transformed that upper room into a bit of heaven with all of the power, the glory, the joy, and the love. It doesn't mention love, but I know there was an immense love for those people. And people who came onto this scene, they experienced the same thing. There must have been a lot of noise. There, <laughs> there must have been a lot of shouting. There used to be some Methodists they call shouting Methodists. They're all dead now. I haven't heard a Methodist shout in my whole life. Okay, all the shouting Methodists are gone. Well, there was some shouting poke there that day. It must have been a tremendous noise, and people gathered to see what was going on. And Peter preached the first Christian sermon ever preached that day to these people who had gathered. He knows when he has a congregation suddenly and can share the gospel. And the first thing he told them is, no, we're not drunk, although it looks like it. He said, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. We are filled with the Spirit of God. And then he went on to tell them about Jesus Christ. It was this boost of the Spirit that let them know that God and his power is bigger than they are. And I think we remember, we, we need to remember, we need to remember this in our lives, whatever you're going through. It doesn't always mean that things are going to turn out the way you want them to. But it does mean that whatever you're going through, God and this power are in there with you. I remember when, when we got news that, that my mother was, was dying. And I thought that I knew she was going to be all right. Okay. I, I, I know enough to know that. We had a wonderful service here yesterday for Julian's mama. Mary brought the message, and uh, the whole family did the service. And one thing I know when people pass is, is they're fine. But those of us left behind, there is the question, how in the world am I going to make it? And my question was, how in the world are my sister and I going to make it when our mother passed? And uh, 
I asked the Lord to see us through, and I received the assurance that, that he would do that, and he did. It was really quite an extraordinary time. I, I figured out just as I thought about this sermon, my mother planted a tree two weeks before she died. I had to wheel her out in the wheelchair to see the tree that she was planted. I told her, Mother, we don't actually have a place for another tree. And she was, it was a crepe myrtle. And I said, Mother, there's too much shade here. This thing's not going to bloom. She said, I don't care. I want to plant a tree. I remember one of my mother's favorite stories was of, of a woman who was 90 years old who planted a little oak sapling in her yard. And someone told her, said, you know, honey, you're never going to see that thing get big. She said, I know, but somebody will. And my mother loved that story. And I know now that's why she was so determined to plant a tree, even though she had planted so many trees in our yard that there wasn't room for any more and wasn't a good place to plant it. And by the way, I was wrong. Last year, it finally got around to blooming 20 years later, okay? It got enough light to put out a bloom. God got us through that time. It was his power. But it doesn't have to be extraordinary things. I hate to tell you this. See if I got, oh, I got time to tell you. I hate to tell you this. I, I've just been overwhelmed ever since I had my blood clots. And the doctor said, well, you, you know, you, you can't lift anything. Uh, you can't, really can't, don't need to do anything. Okay. And, and I didn't for weeks. And everything in the house fell apart. My sister can't do all of it, uh, especially not the part that I do, which is kind of keeping some things straight. And before that, a lot of stuff had got moved, moved around, like there were six extra chairs in one bedroom. And uh, there was place all over the place. And I had been doing a refinishing project. And all of those refinishing projects, uh, stuff was, 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 in, was in one room. And, I have been trying for weeks. Oh, by the way, the, the curse was finally lifted. Uh, the, uh, a couple of weeks ago when I saw my doctor, I said, now can I lift something? Oh, yeah, you can lift something. Yeah, you can go ahead. You can live a normal life, as if I know what a normal life is. Well, anyway, I do the best I can. Well, anyway, anyway she said I could go ahead and work. And so I've been trying to get myself to get things straightened out, but I just I hated to do it. I despised the idea of going through all of that physical labor because I don't know about you, when you get to a certain age, you're not drawn to physical labor anymore. It doesn't seem exciting to you anymore. What once have been fun is now just drudgery, pure drudgery, and I, I could not make myself get up and do it. This is for weeks I've been trying to get it done. And I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you this, but just recently as I was preparing this sermon, I said, you know, this has got to be done. It is interfering with my life. It is interfering with my church work. It is distracting me from what I need to be doing. And I finally said, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize for praying about this. I said, Lord, I know there's a power available, and it doesn't seem like I can get this done. And I reluctantly said, will you help me? Will you give me the power to get this mess straightened out? And over the next five hours, I did it. I did it all. All. My sister has a sleep problem. Some nights she just doesn't sleep, especially if she knows she's going to have to get up early and go somewhere. It's, it's hard. She confessed this morning that last night she prayed that she's missed two nights of sleep. She prayed that she would get a night of sleep. And she got a good night of sleep. What I'm telling you is that God does care about the big things in our life about the people who are hurting and the people who are ill. And when we are hurting and when we are ill, God cares and God is involved. And God cares about everything in our life. 
And we just need to realize that if we say we can't do it, that may not be right. Or it may indeed be right that we can't do it, but with God help, God's help, we can. And our prayer not, may not be sometimes, remove this difficulty from me, take this thorn from my flesh, as Paul said. It may simply be, Lord, let us get through this on the power of your grace. And here's the most important thing I want to say to us. While we're not always going to have an extraordinary religious experience, we do need to feel it. We need to know and feel and feel that God is working in our lives. We need to know and feel that God has guaranteed us the victory, and we cannot lose finally for winning. We need to know and feel that our lives are not temporary. They are everlasting. And there's not even anything that we could do about that. And inevitably, God has given himself through Jesus, Jesus Christ on the cross so that we would know that this ultimate victory in our life is available to us right now. We can live the victory day to day. We can live the power day to day. And sometimes we're going to feel bad and sometimes we're going to feel discouraged. But at the same time, we need to remind ourselves, I'm not alone in this. There is a power available to me from God who loves me. Sometime this week, we're all going to need to know that. God's power to love and to do is available to us. What does the old hymn say? Why should I feel discouraged? His eye is on the sparrow. He's watching me. You can't just know it. You've got to feel it. <laughs> and after that first Pentecost event, the disciples knew it. They had hold of something that was bigger than they could ever imagine. And this power would help them carry out that great commission, take the gospel to the ends of the world. You and I have that same word upon us. This church has that word upon us. This church has that power available to it. Let's give thanks before God. Gracious Lord, thank you that we are not alone. Let us be encouraged. We think that things are falling apart when in fact you hold everything together in your hands. We think it's an ending when it's only a beginning. We think we cannot do it and that may be true, but you can do it through us. So Lord, let us relax our lives into your grace today. And let us trust you in all things, and indeed, let us rejoice and give thanks. Amen.